This interview is for the Veterans History Project with Margaret Rose Foster Henderson, who served as a Navy Communications Intelligence, Intelligence Officer and a Naval Air Transport Officer from July 3, 1943 to October 14, 1946, obtaining the rank of Lieutenant JG. My name is Harriet Williamson. Also in the studio is Henry Radcliffe, the Director of Lighting, Sound, and Video Recording. Today is Tuesday, October 2nd, 2007, and we are in the television studio of WILL on the campus of the University of Illinois in Urbana. Mrs. Henderson, you were on a three-month school trip in the 1930s in Europe. Would you like to begin this interview and talk about that trip? Yes, I'd be glad to. I grew up in Concord, Massachusetts, and my school had a school trip of the summer of 1936. And we went to a number of countries, but uh, we spent three days in Berlin in 1936, and att I attended the opening of the Olympic Games. And um, at that time, I saw Adolf Hitler in person and uh, saw that he wouldn't shake Jesse Owens' hand <coughs> when he won his race. And I happened to also be at the edge of a road that same day, and he came along in a touring car. And that evening, uh, we had been billeted or stayed in uh, different homes in Berlin, and the family that we stayed with uh, happened that night, took us into a room and closed the doors and told us that terrible things were going on in Germany and that their own children, who were in the... Uh, a Hitler youth would turn them in if they found them telling us, but they asked us, there were three of us in this house or apartment, to go back to the U.S. and tell them that <coughs> dreadful things were going on in Germany. And um, I think that stayed with me when I, I went to college at Radcliffe College my senior year. Um, in the middle of the year, uh, a number of, of us were recruited, uh, women, uh, uh, were recruited to take a communications course. It was secret and in cryptanalysis, and uh, I happened to be a history major. Why I was recruited, I don't know, but I took the course, and if we took the course, we, we were um, offered either or assured that we would get a commission in the Navy or you could go in as a civil servant. But we had agreed to, to enlist then, I suppose. Anyway, I took the course and spent a month at Mount Holyoke in officer's training. We were supposed to spend two months, but uh, uh, <coughs> the war was heating up, and so they wanted us in one month. So we, be, some of us became what's called 30 Days Wonders, and I, I became an ensign and was sent to Washington, D.C. There I was assigned to the uh, to Communications Intelligence uh, Office, um, and I was very lucky to be put in the top European theater part, where I didn't have to do <coughs> decoding, uh, but I, my job there was to um, take keep track of the German U-boats, and at that time, that was 1943. Uh, the U-boats, uh, the Allied, um, uh, the Allies were were beginning to get a hold of of the uh, U-boats. They were they were sinking <coughs> shipping right and left. But uh, we had captured uh, one of their codes, or or had broken one of their codes, the Triton code, so that the uh, Communications from the U-boat skippers was being intercepted, and 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 I, always, I think at the same time radar radar had been perfected. But anyway, my particular job in that office was to keep track of the German U-boats, and we had the uh, the uh, German translators in our office. We, we the decoded messages from the U-boats, giving their position, longitude, latitude, were were. <clears throat> uh, wired right into that office, and the German translator then took the decoded messages and, and handed me the um, 
message. And then I took the pins. I had a huge map taking, uh, covering the Atlantic from from Stavanger, Norway, to the Indian Ocean, and and, and every U-boat <laughs> a pin I had to move depending on where they were. And I did coordinate that with with aircraft <coughs> results or aircraft sightings from both British and U.S. airplanes. So all that information is came, comes in, and I keep track of the of the uh, of the uh, map. Um, and then that information actually was was given directly to operations, and operations then sent out uh, uh, planes or whatever to go after the U-boats. Our our office was completely secret, uh, secret, secret, uh, top secret ultra. We worked on um, 24 hours a day, at two weeks, three weeks, three weeks shifts, eight to four, four to midnight midnight to eight in the morning. Uh, the Naval Intelligence Office was located on Nebraska Avenue in Washington, and um, we never could tell any of our friends or any, anybody what we were doing. So that was pretty much my job until the, the uh, U-boats uh, uh, were defeated. And then, uh, let's see, I think that was around 1945. So then I decided I wanted to see something of, of the real Navy, I called it. And so I, I asked to be transferred to Hawaii, but there was no need for women communications <laughs> officers in Hawaii. So they sent me, then I thought, oh, the Air, Naval Air Force would be interesting. And I was assigned to the Naval Air Transport Service, the Atlantic Wing, which uh, the Naval Air <coughs> Transport Service uh, um, had a uh, run from Newfoundland down to Jacksonville, Florida. And um, I eventually, I trained as an air transport officer and I was um, uh, sent, the Patuxent was, Patuxent River, Maryland was the head of the quarters and they had two detachments. Norfolk was one, and I was assigned to the Naval Air Station at Norfolk. And there I was uh, until the end of the war, and it, uh, it ended up that I um, was in charge one day of the whole detachment because people were beginning to get out <laughs> in, in 1946. And they begged me to stay in the Navy, but I didn't see any future for women then. So I, um, I uh, was terminated, uh, let's see, I think in August of 46, but I had, my actual date was October, so I was able to take a um, terminal leave, and at that time you, I could fly on any naval, naval planes I went, wanted to. And a couple of places I went, which are sort of interesting today, I, uh, I caught a trip to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, stayed there a couple of days, came back, and then I thought, oh, I haven't seen Havana, Cuba, and I found another Navy plane going to Havana, and I went there and stayed a few days. I did this with a friend, and so on. So, um, and then on, uh, let's see, October 14th, 1946, ended my service, three years, one month, and 21 days. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what a Naval Air Transport Officer does? What, what was your job? Well, a Naval Air Transport Officer was really in charge of the plane, the, the complete plane when it, uh, when, it came, when it came from the last stop, like going south, it would go Patuxent to Norfolk. And so when it came into the Norfolk um, uh, airfield, uh, it was loaded with, uh, there was a load and balance sheet and it was loaded with, with uh, material going south and the uh, gas, uh, what they call topping the rears, the gas tank. But, and the, allegedly the, the air transport officer was in charge of all that to make sure the load and balance sheet was correct and that the the plane was gassed up, and then you went out on the tarmac and said it was okay. You signed the balance sheet, went out, and, 
and um, and uh, told the captain of the aircraft, you saluted him, and he took off. Of course, it was really the Navy chiefs that took did most of the work. I mean, the officers were in charge, but the Navy chiefs were the ones that really um, were the experts on the load and balance, because you had to balance the plane correctly. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of materials were being carried by these All planes? kinds of supplies. Mm -hmm. We never saw them. Mm -hmm. We also operated, or the Air Transport Service at the time, operated a shuttle between Norfolk and Patuxent River, and that was uh, very popular with, uh, if you could get a ride, I mean, it went by by uh, depending on what your status was, some was official, some was, uh, uh, if there were a few seats left over, anybody that wanted to hitch a ride. Mm -hmm. And I was often in charge of the shuttle and all kinds of sailors and whatnot. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had stories about sick grandmothers they had to get on. <laughs> it was sort of fun. And then uh, Gene Kelly came once to our, our uh, it was quite a stir, came to our, our uh, airfield, and I have a picture somewhere of him, mm -hmm. <laughs> if he's in. And I think, uh, uh, well, anyway, some of the, some of the actors that were uh, performing with the troops at that mm -hmm. time now, when you were in the intelligence part, did you have, were, were you working constantly? So every day you would, you would be involved in? Seven days a week. Okay. Yeah. And was there a feeling of urgency while you were doing that? Yes. But, mm -hmm. but see, but 40, I think it was 40, well, I, I've actually, um, we had captured the, we had broken the code in 42, so by the time I got in, in um, or started work in July of 43, um, the convoys in early 43 were going after the U-boats, and, and the radar had been perfected, and um, so that the Allied sea power was beginning to slam the U-boat fleet. So when I got in, the urgency wasn't quite as high as it, it would have been. And um, uh, I think by the, by, see, by 19, well, no, it was another year. Well, yes, it was a lot of immediate urgency because we still didn't know what, what, uh, how things were going to go. Mm -hmm. What was it like working in Washington, D.C., which was probably the, well, the um, headquarters for all the war efforts? Well, we, we, we got our own quarters. They didn't have enough uh, quarters for, for all the military in Washington. So uh, we, we had, some of us had an apartment, and then some of us that knew each other rented a house in Washington, Chevy Chase Circle, five of us. <laughs> and it happened to be owned by a... Um, a um, well, he wasn't a mafia person, but sort of a, a, a rather uh, criminal type. But his sister ran it, and they tried to get us out. See, there was there was uh, <laughs> it was rent control, and he thought he was going to get us out. But we all dressed up in our uniforms and went to court and won our case. Mm. It was sort of fun. <laughs> he didn't have a chance. Well, no, he never appeared, but we heard he was quite a criminal figure in the mm -hmm. underground. No, living in Washington at that time, there were, it was full of military people working and so on. And, and in our off time, we tried, you know, we tried to have some fun and go to restaurants mm -hmm. and things. But it was pretty much work, because you would, you would, uh, um, but our, our, our uh, house, it was interesting. There were four waves and one civilian, and uh, one of my one of the waves, uh, who also was, had been a classmate at Radcliffe, was in the top Pacific Theater, and which involved Japan and everything. But we could never communicate. Mm -hmm. None of us ever said a word about mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now there were not that many women in the military. Did you have any? feelings of, of being special or that this was uh, an important mission given that 
Um, no, I think I think we just realized we were place we were placing the men on on shore. I mean, mm -hmm. so they could go. Oh, and and we just felt that we felt important that we were mm -hmm. doing something. Um, later on, as I mentioned, I didn't feel there was any future at the time for women. Why did you feel that? Um, I don't really know. I just, mm -hmm. I just felt that. Um, let's see. Did you face any discrimination? Do you think? No, I don't. I don't mm -hmm. remember any. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, in speaking with people and everything, and 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 going up, I think the men had the higher posts and everything, and it was pretty much male dominated. Mm -hmm. um, there were some women that stayed on. I just, it just wasn't something that interested me. Mm -hmm. Now, have you had any, attended any reunions of... Uh, any reunions? Mm -hmm, in no. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, I've never heard from anybody. You see, that, that being in that particular naval intelligence group was very different than mm -hmm. being on a warship or being... And, and n never have had mm -hmm. any communication with anybody. There were a number of math professors in, in our office, uh, and uh, one rather famous uh, uh, one from Harvard, uh, Van, uh, Van Norman Quine. I think he's dead now, but I knew him a little bit mm -hmm. anyway. But no, we never had any. Uh, and the, even in the air transport, I've never heard from anybody. Mm -hmm. or had any kind of reunions. I don't know of anybody. Did the people uh, that you worked with, be they women or men, did, do you think any of those people went into the intelligence service that followed in the Cold War? Uh, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. I know that the, the uh, most of the officers were reserve officers, mathematicians. They went back to their colleges or institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a regular Navy man in charge of our our unit, but I, I don't know. He probably, I don't know what he did. Mm -hmm. Sure, I'm sure some of them did, but most of the reserve officers like uh, went back to their civilian jobs. Mm -hmm. One was head of the Fog Art Museum at Harvard. <laughs> I mean, they weren't likely to stay in mm -hmm. because they already had uh, mm -hmm. good jobs or, or fields. And uh, the only people I ever heard from were my roommates in the house. I mean, but we were all in different areas mm -hmm. and such. But no, never had any reunions, never heard anything. I don't even know what, what our unit would be called, technically, mm -hmm. because everything was so secret. Can can we go back to um, 1936 and to Germany? You were at that time around 15 years old. Right. So when you had um, people telling you about uh, s terrible things were going on in Germany, and when you go back to the United States, could you talk about that? Did you were you able to take that in because you were quite young? No, I had just turned 15. I mean, uh -huh. 14. I was a very young, naive uh -huh. 14. Um, no, I think the East Coast, however, probably was a little more aware of what things were going on because I can remember at my school we got uh, we we began to get a few refugees coming from Europe that mm -hmm. were g getting out families that saw and some of them Jewish, of course, but um, and I think I think people were a little more aware of what was going on, but. You know, if you tried to, I mean, as a 14 or 15 year old, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'd, I'd tell people, I told my parents, anybody I could, but I, mm -hmm. it wasn't much I could do. What was, what was your parents' reaction? Well, I think, I think they understood, uh, but you know, not, it's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, what can you do? Mm -hmm. I mean. Uh, how, what can I do today to stop the war in Iraq? I feel helpless. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's because I, we're not in a position of power mm -hmm. of any kind. And uh, I, I suppose 
trying. It's hard to think back. It's so long mm -hmm. ago, but I think most of us knew something was going on, and and w the, the group of us that had been on the trip were well aware that, I mean, they were it, that things in Germany were were getting worse. You could mm -hmm. tell. I mean, there were military people all around, and even when we we cheer at the Olympic Games those first couple of days. Uh, German guards would come down and tell us to be quiet. Hmm. When you were cheering for yeah, we all US sat team? together. Yeah, we'd cheer for for American runner and um, the uh, the uh, German guards up and down the stadium. They'd come down and tell us to be quiet. Hmm. They didn't want us to cheer. <laughs> of course, none of us bothered. You know, it didn't bother us that much. Mm -hmm. Although. Um, well, if you really want to know a little more, uh, the, the tour was run by a man named Mr. Tofern, who had been a German. And I think the Nazis were a little suspicious. You know, they're beginning to harass outsiders. And when we got to Garmisch Partenkirchen on our way from Berlin, I was arrested um, in the youth. We stayed in youth hostels, and I was arrested by two men or I mean I wasn't taken to a police station but they grabbed me and brought me in a room and started uh, speaking German and my I my German was very poor so I was very indignant and the head of the tour Mr. Tofern came and he um, what he found out was that some young man there had accused me of stealing money well the whole thing was ridiculous because when it came to what time and where, I had been with six other people at a little concert. It was obviously a, a, a jumped up thing. And of course, mm -hmm. I thought it was a lark. Of course, mm -hmm. it would have scared other people, mm -hmm. but I'm, you know, I didn't know any better. But it was interesting that um, uh, the sum of money I finally found out that I was supposed to have stolen was 95 cents. And then the next year, I think Mr. Tofen was foolish, but he took another group in 37, and I was told that on that tour, one of his uh, group was arrested for murder. That's uh, what I heard. So obviously the Nazis were harassing, mm -hmm. and I think because he was German, they were harassing our, our group, mm -hmm. and he'd come to America. I don't know, but for me it was sort of exciting. <laughs> Were there any other inklings of war in the other countries that you visited on this trip? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking back about that, and certainly not in England at the time. See, we stayed in youth hostels except for Paris. We stayed in a hotel. Berlin, we stayed with, with uh, inhabitants. That's how we happened to be. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think so. When you came back remember. to the United States, were, was there any report about the Jesse Owens and Hitler? Not oh shaking yeah, his hand? yeah. It was in all the newspapers mm -hmm. that Hitler wouldn't shake his hand because he was black, mm -hmm. and of course we'd seen it, so we thought that was the opening day ceremonies were really interesting because all the nations paraded and they had, you know, they brought the the eternal flame first and. Uh, what we particularly were interesting to watch, which nations wouldn't hail Hitler? Uh -huh. See, as they marched along in groups mm -hmm. today, it's so, you know, it's so, uh, so much more, it was simpler in those mm -hmm. days in the mm -hmm. stadium. But uh, as nations went around, they hailed Hitler, the ones that were in favor. And, and so, uh, of course, the Americans didn't, mm -hmm. the French didn't, the English didn't, but there were many nations that, Hailed Hitler, mm. and when I was at the at, at the roadside, I don't know what I'm imagining all this, but I looked around, and all these Germans around me looked like they were they were in a trance, and they were all hailing Hitler as he walked by, and they mm -hmm. all seemed seemed like they were they were, uh, and I I may be, you know, maybe partly my fancy, but I felt that they were sort of. I don't know, in a daze. Mm -hmm. And I looked around, they were all hiling, and I thought, this is ridiculous. But you see, it, you know, being 14 and on the young side of a 14. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is there anything else you would like to talk about uh, that trip? I can't think of it okay. right now. Mm -hmm. Would you like to t talk any further about your military service or your recruitment into the military? 
Well, there isn't much to say. I, I feel um, that I had a very good experience. It was good, very good experience. Um, and uh, I felt it was, I guess we all felt in World War II that it was a, uh, it was a necessary war. I don't approve of war at all. And I, I uh, as I told you, I've been watching Ken Burns, and if, if anybody thinks war is, is, um, is, a, uh, is a terrible thing, and I, I really don't approve of um, invading countries. I've, I've made that decision just mm -hmm. to go to war or just to gain power or mm -hmm. to gain territory or oil fields or whatever. I think, I think it's senseless. How do you think this experience um, influenced your life? Well, I think, I think in a way, it it solidified my feeling that war is 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 not the way to to improve the world. I'm very anti-war now, and um, I don't think it solves anything. Mm -hmm. I think. I think we somehow have to get along. We have to use diplomacy. And uh, I, I don't know whether there's much hope, but I'd like to think we could <laughs> someday. I don't know. Now, before you left the Navy, you were able to do some traveling. Uh, and one of the places that you traveled to was Cuba. What was Cuba like at that point in time? Well, I, I went, you know, Guantanamo Bay was a regular Navy base, and the few days there, I stayed in the bachelor officer's quarters and looked around the vegetation, and, and I, um, it was interesting. But, to, but when I went back and went to Havana, Havana was a very exciting, bustling city, lots of fun. They had high lie. We stayed in the Hotel Nacional, which is a famous hotel. People were People were uh, very friendly. It it was this was before uh, uh, Castro. Mm -hmm. I never even heard of him at that point. So it was just a lot of fun and interesting, and people were happy. And and, and um, we stayed three or four days and had a wonderful time. Went to a highlight match and whatnot. <laughs> Did you do any other for traveling during during your st uh, time in the navy? Well, at the end, my terminal leave, I took advantage of, of uh, the uh, Navy planes. I could travel on any Navy planes, if, uh, depending on priority. And so I took a trip to the West Coast and uh, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, where my brother was, a sailor. Mm -hmm. he, had, he had finally, uh, he was younger than I am, but he had finally gotten in. And uh, I, uh, so I, I had a nice trip because we'd stop at different places. Like on the way out, we stopped at uh, Jacksonville, not Jacksonville, what, um, I'm trying to think. Anyway, various cities I'd never been, Tucson, Arizona, and so on. Wherever there was a naval base, mm -hmm. you could stop and either spend the night in a, and they always had a place, a bachelor officer's quarters. Uh, later on, I, I was, I stayed in the Naval Reserve, but once I had a child, I was put out. I how, mean, I was How terminated. long were you in the Naval Reserve? Um, probably, I, I don't know the exact date, but when I had my first child, it was 1949, mm -hmm. 48, and I was just getting a promotion, but uh, at that time, now the Navy, of course, y y having a child is not, mm -hmm. you're not, but that was the end of that. So I'm a little envious of some of my male um, uh, friends who, who still had all the privileges. They stayed in the Naval Reserve and they have a nice pension. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> they can travel on Naval aircraft mm -hmm. if they want mm -hmm. and have all the, the, uh, all the uh, amenities. But the women, no. If you, if you got married and had a child, you were out. Well, I don't know when that changed. My husband always said I should sue the Navy, and I kept telling him I'm too old <laughs> to <laughs> sue the Navy. <laughs> well, do you think that um, women's status improved as a result of their service in World War II? I, I presume it did, yeah. 
Women's status improved all over gradually. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it was just in the services. Um, I would say that that uh, it's it, it, it's just improved in general, mm -hmm. in all all walks of life. Um, I have friends now who 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 are still very women's lib, but I do think women are pretty much uh, pretty equal now mm -hmm. in rights and whatnot. Is there anything that we have not talked about during this discussion that you would like to mention in ter or elaborate on in terms of your service or the mood of the country or um, your travel experiences? Um, I think I've pretty much covered everything okay. I can think of at the moment. Okay, well, thank you very, very much for being with us today. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you.